Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, and welcome to Demystifying Startup Finance and Tax with KPMG. My name is Colin Mahan, and I'm a program manager at the NASDAQ Entrepreneurial Center. And for those of you who may not know, the NASDAQ Center is a nonprofit dedicated to enabling entrepreneurs from all over the world to realize their maximum potentials and grow. As you may have just seen in the chat, the NASDAQ Center, along with our partner Mentor Club, launched a free mentor matching platform for entrepreneurs called Mentor Makers. You can create your own advisory board to guide and inspire you with in the moment mentorship from topic experts and professionals dedicated to providing exceptional mentorship to entrepreneurs across all races, industries, and geographies. So find or become a mentor today by using the link in the chat. Mentorship matters to all entrepreneurs. Their success is dependent on it. Now, none of what we do here at the center could be possible without all of the amazing support from our sponsors, including NASDAQ, Lehigh University, Bank of the West, KPMG, Wilson Sonsini, Woodruff Sawyer, and BPM. We are grateful and humbled by their contributions. Now, quick housekeeping item. We're gonna open up for live Q&A at the end of the event. So please submit your questions at the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen throughout the presentation. We also have your questions that you submitted ahead of time, so we hope to get to all of those as well as the ones that you have live. During these still unique times, we're curious on how sentiment is among the entrepreneurs that we work with. So before we get started, I'm gonna launch a quick poll to let us know just how you're doing just today. It's Friday, so hopefully y'all are doing a little bit better, but totally understand that there's some uh, survival mode and anxiety out there as, they, as you guys are continuing to grow your businesses in these unique times. So I'm gonna end this poll, share those results. Looks like optimism's on the rise, so it is Friday. I totally understand that some of you have some anxiety and just survival mode out there. So hopefully our presentation today will help alleviate some of those feelings. So without any further delay, please join me in giving me, please join me in giving a warm welcome in the chat to our special guest today. Marissa Johnson, close friend of the center, is an audit senior manager at KPMG, and Minji Gu, tax manager at KPMG also. Welcome, Minji and Marissa. Thrilled to have you back on our virtual stage. Thank you, Colin. Um, we are so excited to be speaking with you today about accounting and tax issues that may arise and be applicable to your business. We're here, as Colin mentioned, from KPMG, and which is a global audit tax and advisory firm that offers services to all stages of companies in all aspects of their accounting and finance functions. I hope that we'll offer some insights that may be helpful to, to you and answer any questions that you may have. However, if we don't have the answer between the two of us today, we'll definitely be able to find it for you. Um, this is a benefit of being at such a large firm. To introduce myself, um, I am Marissa Johnson and I am a senior manager in our audit practice focused primarily on venture capital backed startup technology companies from early stage into a few years following the IPO. My experiences range from in technology industry, including platform SaaS, advertising, health tech, and fintech. And I love what I do because I get to be a resource and partner to high growth companies with passionate and creative founders that are achieving their dreams. Um, I have been involved with the NASDAQ Center for a couple of years, and I am happy to be back with you today. Um, I'm going to let Minji also introduce himself, and he's going to cover the first part of our presentation, which I will work on sharing at the same time. Thank you. Thank you, Marissa. Hello, everyone. My name is Minji Gu. I'm the tax manager from KPMG Tax Practice. I have been with the firm for seven years. Um, has, my specialty is on the corporate tax and the merge acquisition deal related transaction. So my client portfolio is from startup, middle size, private market, um, IPO, um, like even the, the big uh, Fortune 10 tech company. So, really want to take this opportunity to share our tax insights on the early stage of the company and then re really look forward to it. Minji, can you see the slides okay? Look yeah. great. Perfect. So, 
So I will focusing on the the first two items mainly what's the company structure consideration at the early stage and what's the tax planning um, opportunity at the early stage. And then Marissa will focus on the more introduction of the financial statements and some like uh, implementing control and assessing the audit requirement. First is the choosing a company structure. So when you start a business, you always want to segregate your personal liability from the company's liability, right? Because you don't want to be in the future, have a lawsuit. You don't want to be your personal asset being touched. So it is important to set up a company to shield your personal assets from the potential liability claims in the future. And really depending on what type of the entity you set up, the, the tax consequences will be different. Um, on how you tax your business income. More importantly, you won't be, be attractive to the potential investor. So keep, have a well-organized structure is very important in the early stage of the company growth. Next page. So to set up a company, we need to have a different we need to consider the following step, right? The first one, we need to consider what type of entity we need to set up. Just giving the overview, we have like a corporation, partnership, limited liability, company LLC. That's the three main um, entity type you will see. Um, you will also hear like an S Corp, but S Corp, keep in mind, S Corp is like not entity type. It's more like a tax election. So you have to set up a corporation or LLC first, and then elect to S Corp for tax purpose. So you need to work with your lawyer and accountant to make sure what type of entity is the best suit for your company. Standing from the investor perspective, they always pre prefer the C Corp, the corporation, because uh, it's more standard and easy to be IPO. Um, so this is C Corp. Corporation is the required format to be the IPO, right? But of course, there will be some other advantage of the LLC. For example, for the corporation, the tax will be layered into on both the individual level and the entity level. What that mean? For example, your company owns like a hundred dollars this year, and then you need to pay the twenty-one percent of corporate rate, twenty-one dollars, right? And then if it has a dividend, you pay like a $10 dividend to the shareholder. Then share in the shareholder personal income tax return, think about it, this $10 has been taxed twice, right? It has been taxed at the corporate level and then also taxed at your personal shareholder level. So this is kind of the disadvantage of the corporation to have a double taxation system. But the advantage of LLC is you only have a one layer of tax. All those the company's income and loss will be passed through to the owner's shareholder of LLC and then report their income tax return. So this is kind of the key benefit of an LLC. So this is the first step, right? You need to determine what type of the entity setup, what the benefit is, and then work with your lawyer to, you know, thinking about your company name, but at the same time, conduct the trademark and the registration research to make sure the name is not being by the others to providing the similar product and service. And then your lawyer will help you to prepare a lot of legal, legal documentation by laws to make sure, also choose the location of the entity you want to set up, right? Either in Delaware or Washington. So this is something you also need to consider. Then after that, you will get started to hire the talent, right? So you need to consider what kind of the benefit package offering to the employee. At the early stage of the company, incentive like um, stock option will be always attractive to the employee because they can grow with the firm. But keep in mind, you may have a different tax implication to the employee on different types of the options. 
um, mainly high level, there will be two type of the option you would usually consider. The first one is the ISO, or we call incentive stock option. Um, this is kind of a qualified option regulated under the RS tax code because the employee will get very favorable tax treatment from the, this ISO. It will not be taxed until the employee exercise those stock and sold those shares. So any gain will be subject to the capital gain regime. You know, for your personal liability, capital gain will be have a lower rate, either 15% or 20%, versus your ordinary income will have a gradual tax rate, right? The highest is the 39%. So it's very beneficial to have the ISO to the employee to get the lower rate benefit. So this is the first type. The third, second type is the non-qualified awards. Basically, except ISO, any other options like straight stock will be under the regime of the non-qualified rewards. The non-qualified rewards is usually subject to the ordinary income category. Once employee exercise, it will go to a W-2. You know, you won't get the, 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 um, the lower rate benefit. But there was like one exception, like if the employee believes the company value will be goes up in the future, they can make a tax election. Like when the on the day of the grant of the option, they want to pay tax upfront at honorary income. And then when the company grows, the value goes up, any subsequent increase of a value will be subject to the capital gain regime, which is a beneficial again. So the employee and the company need to work together to see whether they want to make that election, right? Um, so there's different types of the stock option equity benefit to the employee to help you to attract the talent. Then the last one you need to consider what's the company growth and the exit strategy, whether at a certain stage you want to be being buyout or being a being IPO. At that time, it's very important to there's a lot of a factor you need to consider your structure, right? As I mentioned, if you want to be an IPO, you have to be like a corporation. You have to convert LLC or S Corp into C Corp to be ready to be IPO. Next slide. Then there was the other important legal matter you need to consult with your your, your lawyers, right? The equity arrangement, IP ownership, employment terms, because you have to mitigate those potential risk, dispute risk and the legal cost to resolve if there is any dispute in the future. So it's very important to work with different service provider to resolve the different issue. Next slide. Then tax planning consideration. So for tax planning consideration, there is, um, it's always very important to have a tax planning at your early stage because it's always value added um, to the company to help your cash flow, to help you to mitigate any risk to your business. So usually the company pay, usually pay attention to the following three key area, the registration requirements, the tax consideration in your early stage, and then tax compliance matters. So speaking of registration requirements, there are mainly two types. One is your legal. So if you want to do new business in one state or different state, you need to register with the secretary of a state with your lawyer or registered agent. So this is a legal matter, right? You need to be a register in that, the states in the state you're doing business and then the second is your tax matters, whether you apply for the tax ID to the RS online or state local tax. But more importantly, you need to have a clear, clear overview what's your tax filing obligation, right? Either you have a federal income tax, state income tax, sales and use tax, property tax, employee tax. So you, you either need to register tax online or you have a very clear ob obligation you need to file those returns in a monthly basis quarterly basis or annual basis so at early stage of your company first of all as i mentioned 
you need to have a very clear overview of what kind of a tax you have obligation to pay for or file for, right? Um, in the early stage, because the company is still in the development stage, you may not have a lot of contract. You, you only drive a little bit of revenue, but still in the lost position. So for the income tax perspective, it's not your priority, right? If you are still in the lost position, it just fell in the tax return for federal and income, but you don't have any tax exposure. At early stage, what you need to focus on um, um, to prioritize is the cash liability, um, su such as sales use tax. Sales use tax is based on the revenue, the sales of your service and the products, right? You need to have a clear obligation. What's your filing requirements? What's your collecting requirement from those taxes from your end user consumer and the remit to the states? Because those kind of the cash payment you need to remit to the tax authority. Same with property tax and the payroll tax, those all all cash tax, no matter you are in the lost position or not. Then you need to think about for your work workforce, whether you should be categorized your workforce as employee or independent contractor. That's important because you don't need to you, you don't have an obligation to withhold any payroll tax and the fringe benefit for the independent contractor, but for the employee, you need to take everything for them. Then we also need to also consider what's the tax consequences for some non-cash benefits, such as the stock-based compensation, as I mentioned before. Previously, we're standing at employee side, whether it's a capital gain, or is the ordinary income different based on different types of the op um, option. Right now, we need to stand on the company side, the employer side, to see what's the tax consequences, right? I always treat it like, like it's a mirror image. If the employee reported ordinary income in their W-2, then the company can take the deduction. If the employee treat as a capital gain, then the company cannot take a deduction because capital gain and uh, ordinary expense is in different categories. So it's always keeping in mind those are kind of an impact. You will often see, right, for if you go to the public filing, if you look at like Netflix, Google, you will see those companies, effect tax rate is very low, is like 3% or 5%. One of the driver is the stock-based compensation deduction for the company. Because for those tech companies, their stock price is so high, you know, when the employee exercise those or vest is their option of stock, they will have a huge ordinary income in the W-2. At the same side, the company can take a huge tax deduction for those stock-based compensation. It will have decreased their effect tax rate significantly. So this is kind of one of the key area for the co company to consider, you know, to manage your, your federal and state income tax liability because those will be your potential large deduction in your tax return. Then you, you will also explore the any R&D credits incentive the company you will qualify for. For example, the most companies see the credits like R&D credits, right? If you have any R research and development expense, though can be subject for the R&D credits. But keep in mind, R&D credits is not refundable. You have to be in the income position to offset your tax liability. If you're in the loss position, then you will just carry over those R&D &D credits um, until you are in the income position. And then you, if you not use it, it will expire in 20 years. And then the last step is if you have any transaction, big transaction, either acquisition or disposal, you need to make sure you have a different source of tax advice, either lawyer, CPAs to help you to negotiate, to look at to do the due diligence before you make any decision on the acquisition or disposal. Next page. Tax compliance. Right. Um, so you at your stage, you know, usually you either have hire someone to help you to 
doing all the tax matter, or you work with the tax advisor, right? Maybe a small CPA firm to help handling all the sales use tax return, uh, state income tax return, payroll matters. But it is important to have a tracker of what's the company's obligation. That's the key to help you to check what's your payment due, what's your compliance return due to avoid any late payment or delinquent returns. Next page. Evaluate your tax, your state tax profile. As I previously mentioned, at early stage of the company, sales and use tax is the most one of the material cash tax the company to deal with. Then how do you determine you have a sales and use tax liability in different states, right? Because in the US, the tax system is different state have their different rule to tax um, when you're doing the business in that state. So 50 states have totally 50, state, 50 different rules. So high level, how do we determine you have a tax liability or you have a tax obligation in that state is based on your nexus study. So we have a different threshold, for example, the physical presence nexus. What that mean? It means if you have any property, no matter it's owned or leased in that state, or you hire the employee from that state, so 99% you have the nexus to that state. So you need to have to file the income tax return and the, and, and, and the sales use tax returns. And then if you don't have any physical presence, then you, we go to the economic nexus. Basically, they, different states have a different threshold. Some states say if you have like a more than a hundred dollar revenue in, in this jurisdiction, then you need to file those states. So you need to go through one by one, work with your advisor to do conduct this kind of a nexus study to make sure your compliance with uh, to filing all the sales and use tax return to avoid any potential risk if the tax authority is tracing you. Planning ahead, right? So you need to plan ahead. Once the company grows, you may sell more product and service to worldwide, to, to different state tax footprint. So that with the company grows, you need to make sure your tax counsel work with your business people to know the company's growth, to know from business side how the company plan. Because from ta tax perspective, we need to monitor with the footprint of company to determine the, any further um, either income tax or sales use tax, federal or state, different level. If you have like a worldwide selling, then you need to consider other foreign country sales and use tax. So there are a lot of a planning opportunity. You also need to be monitoring what's the regulation um, in the world, right? So for example, recently, it's a very hot topic in our tax world. You know, the, Biden, the President Biden will propose uh, another tax reform by the end of this year. The tax, corporate tax rate will increase, individual tax will increase, and there are a lot of international tax provision will impact the business. So similar as in 2017, Donald Trump has his own tax reform plan, right? That was the largest tax planning, tax reform since 1986. So you, we need to track the, um, the, the law changes. So what's the impact on your business, um, on your personals? And you need to do the planning, right? Whether I need to do some planning to have more income. Right now, we are facing a potential uh, income tax increase. So which meaning I need to consider, I need to have a more revenue right now to have a lower tax and have a try to have more deduction in the future with a higher rate, right? So there was a lot of a planning opportunity over there. You need to, you can work with your um, advisor to to take those per benefit. Okay, that's all I have. I will turn to Marissa on the financial statement side. Thank you, Minji. That was a lot and I appreciate all of your insights on the tax considerations, it's really complicated. So I appreciate you joining and helping out with that piece today. Um, as Minji mentioned, I'll move us into now the 
introduction and to review of financial statements. Um, and as you think about building and growing your business, it's important for you to understand where you're heading and looking at comparable company. Financial statements is a great way to start. Their public filings will highlight their growth trajectories, costs, important metrics that are viewed to indicate performance and margins. Um, knowing how you compare and your plans against those metrics will help you in discussions with potential investors or bankers. Um, I'm going to switch, hopefully, my presentation now into um, a set of financial statements so we can kind of go through some of these financial terms together. Um, I chose DoorDash um, because they're a recent IPO of ours and top of mind, I'm sure for all of us as we continue to work through this remote uh, shelter in place environment. Um, to look up any set of financial statements, they're all on the web, the online at sec.gov slash Edgar. Um, and you can type in any company's name into this search bar um, and it'll bring you to the next page. Um, the first thing to understand is the difference between some of these reports. The ones that you'll really focus on are the 10Q and 10K. Um, the 10Q is quarterly while the 10K is annual. Generally, the 10Qs are um, a bit condensed and are shorter um, with less information included in them. So for this purpose, I would encourage starting with the 10K. Um, and I have that pulled up here. Um, and throughout the document, there are various different sections. It's a long document. So kind of understanding your way around it is hopefully going to be helpful. Um, the first section is the business section. And this is really like the marketing materials of the document. This is where the company will describe its business, tell its story, what they want investors to know about um, from the business strategy, as well as the metrics and the important focuses of the company going forward. Um, one thing to highlight is that the com all companies now will really be putting a lot more um, documentation and disclosure around ESG, um, environmental social governance, to as this becomes a greater focus for the community overall. Um, so you really start to see a lot more companies um, including statements around what they're doing from a diversity and environmental perspective. Um, the next section is the risk factors. Um, and th in this section, the company um, essentially is warning investors for anything that could go wrong. Um, for example, with the COVID-19 pandemic, all, all companies added additional risks associated with the uncertainty that is um, within the COVID-19 pandemic and as it's continued over the past year and a half. Um, you'll see that in DoorDash's case, they have a little bit of an opposite risk in saying that as COVID-19 vaccines roll out um, and as we move out of the pandemic, they're expecting that revenue growth may decrease um, given the benefits that they gained over the last 18 months. Um, the next section to cover is the um, MDNA. This is management. This is where management gets to provide their insights on the performance of the company. There will, they will include the metrics. You'll see here that we have um, their key business and non-GAAP metrics, as well as a description of what is included in various components of their financial information. So a good way to understand what, the mon what their money is being spent on, um, what types of costs that, uh, that they're looking at, and so you can understand what may be coming your way in the future. Um, they'll also include discussion of the reasons for fluctuations in their 
revenues and various um, expenses captions. Um, and then finally, at the very end, um, we get to the financial statements. Um, the financial statements will have first the report of the independent audit firm. Um, the audit firm will make a conclusion at the top here where they say that the financial statements are presented fairly um, in all material respects. Um, and then we'll highlight various things throughout the opinion. Um, recently, we've been also required to include docu like additional documentation on some specific uh, or to describe specific audit procedures that are being performed over areas that require additional judgment or complexity. Um, and so those are also now included in the opinion. Um, and then we get into the balance sheet which is a, just a point in time view of the company's assets and liabilities um, and equity balances, the statement of operations, which summarizes revenue and expenses over a period of time um, in the 10K being an annual report, it will be um, the annual period. Um, so seeing how companies present uh, their financials is also Something interesting is it varies across industries on if they'll have a separate like margin line following cost of sales or not. You'll see that it's not here. And here they separate out depreciation and amortization. Um, and then we have the statement of stockholders equity, which shows the changes in the equity accounts period over period. Um, in DoorDash's case, these are their 2020 financials. As we know, they went public at the end of 2020. So we see the additional shares um, issued as part of the IPO and the conversion of the preferred stock at that point in time as well. So those are some of their bigger changes last year. Um, and then finally, we have our statement of cash flow, which um, demonstrates the changes in income statement and balance sheet accounts and reconciles those two changes in cash for the period. I know these numbers are tiny, <laughs> um, but I think we'll also be dropping the link into the chat so you can take a look at them yourself. Um, and then finally, after we get to here, then um, there's the notes to the financial statements. This is where the company will describe their significant accounting policies and methodologies that they take for accounting for certain um, numbers on their financial statements, as well as providing, in some cases, um, more detail as to their financial statement balances. Um, for example, most will show like a breakdown of like in this case, revenue um, and fixed assets. So you can see what those look like more. Okay, so we'll move back now to the slides to go through the remaining of the financial terms. Um, let's see, we went through those. So these next ones I'll go through fairly quickly. Um, GAAP is our set of rules for accounting. Um, it's defined by the Financial Accounting Standards Board or the FASB. Um, and then the accrual basis of accounting versus cash basis of accounting. Um, financial statements presented under GAAP will be under the accrual basis of accounting, which means that revenue and expenses will be recognized when earned or incurred, um, as opposed to when the cash is received or spent. Um, so that's the difference between those two. Generally, um, smaller companies may work with the cash basis of accounting in early stages, but as you grow um, to be comparable, most companies will use the accrual basis. 
Um, next is EBITDA. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with EBITDA. This is a way to measure um, cash flow. It's about to it estimates operating cash flows of a company by excluding from income or loss uh, expenses that don't impact cash. Companies will oftentimes present also an adjusted EBITDA in which they will exclude additional items like stock-based compensation expense as a non-cash expense or one-off transactions like IPO financings or um, or acquisition-related expenses. Um, gross margin is essentially the percentage of revenue you're keeping after the direct costs that are needed to make that revenue. Um, the expectation is that your margin will align with your peer group. So understanding the margins of your comparable companies will help you to understand what you should be moving toward. And then fixed costs are those costs that are generally constant despite the performance of the company like headcount costs. Um, whereas variable costs are will vary with the company's output, like commissions or in DoorDash's case, increased payments to drivers. Um, day sales outstanding is a calculation of how many days it will take a company to collect cash after a sale is made. The calculation is shown here on the slide and we'll get these slides out after. Um, a lower value means it takes less days to collect. This metric will fluctuate by industry as well. So for example, um, an advertising technology company will have customers that are advertising agencies that oftentimes won't pay until their brand pays them, which may um, result in a longer um, DSO consistent with an overall industry, whereas platform companies oftentimes get paid through credit card right up front. And in those cases, obviously their DSO is about zero. Um, in the next one is working capital, which measures whether a company has enough assets to cover its current liabilities. Capital expenditures are costs associated with purchasing physical assets like property equipment and buildings and leverage is a measure of how much debt is used to finance a company's assets. So a higher leverage means that more debt is used. Um, and as I mentioned, use the MDNA to understand how the company describes its financial and non-financial metrics as the descriptions will give you insights in how the company and its investors think about the performance of the business. Um, also, we did look at the opinion in DoorDash's document which did not include considerations of ICAFR or internal controls over financial reporting, but companies that have been public for a longer period of time will. Um, so you'll see that also in the opinion, um, which is a good segue into my next topic, which is some additional thoughts on maintaining accounts, implementing controls, and assessing audit requirements. Um, before we jump in, my main piece of advice here is to keep everything. Um, having that documentation will help you both from a tax perspective as well as an accounting perspective as you move forward and having the supporting documentation be behind your revenues and expenses will be essential. Okay, there are many reasons, obviously, as to why having a mechanism to ensure accurate account balances are important, including these on the slide and range from tax filings to external and investor communication. Further, the financial balances can help you make strategic decisions based on your plans for the future. Um, for early stage companies, we really encourage you to keep the process for account maintenance as simple as possible. There's definitely no need for a full scale ERP system and there are many options to get help on a smaller scale um, for accounting, legal, employment matters, um, including payroll taxes. 
Um, again, keep everything. One of the best ways that you'll be able to ensure you have accurate records, both from for accounting and tax, is to make sure you have all the supporting documents. Hopefully, in this fully paperless world, maintaining these documents can be as easy as dropping into a separate inbox or saving into a dedicated folder in the cloud or on your desktop. Um, a few things that you'll want to make sure you get right early is revenue recognition and tax compliance so you don't get yourself into a bad place later. I know Minji talked about this a lot, um, but there are definitely companies that get to a place where they end up needing to pay millions of dollars in sales tax for historical sales since they didn't know to charge it through to the customer. Um, but now there are many payment processors that provide functionality for charging sales tax to customers um, with just a toggle switch. So making sure you understand that so it doesn't become a burden on the company later on um, is really important. Um, and then finally, of course, investors are always really interested in liquidity. So making sure you're comfortable with your cash forecast is important. And I'll go through that a little bit more in a little bit. Um, in terms of creating controls, early on, um, I would really just focus on creating your controls around cash, um, making sure you know where your cash is going and why um, is and validate the balances at least monthly against your bank statements. Also ensure that you have controls around protecting systems and IP, especially with the increased instances of cyber breaches lately, having appropriate protection around proprietary information, whether it be internal or external, is key. Um, you really don't want that as part of your early stage uh, press. And finally, Make sure that you understand the terms of all your contracts, both so you can ensure fairness and alignment with strategic goals, um, and also so you can maintain compliance with those terms following the signatures. Um, compliance both in terms of debt arrangements or revenue or things like that to make sure that you're covering your bases. And then in terms of cash flow forecasting, start with the cash that you have on hand. Um, actually without consideration for what you think you're going to get. So for example, um, if you're in discussions with banks on getting financing, don't include that financing until um, in your cash flow forecasts until you actually have it. Um, then consider cash receipts from customers based on your payment terms and your DSO. Um, that term that we talked about earlier, and also consider your expenses, both fixed and variable. Um, if you're in a growth stage, there's an expectation that your expenses will grow to fund and fuel the growth of your company, oftentimes through additional headcount and the related costs um, ahead of the growth in the top line. Um, and finally, like in any good relationship, Communicating your plans to anyone else involved is important to make sure that all parties are aligned and will maintain on track for your budgets and um, to hit on your forecasts. Um, my last bit here is on audit and filing requirements. Um, in most cases, private companies are not required to have audited financial statements. However, private companies may need or choose to have audits completed to comply with debt or preferred stock investor agreements or to ensure accurate financial information and have the audited financial statements available for investors or in the case that they may need them down the road. Um, when choosing whether and when to do an audit, I would definitely encourage you to consider the availability of resources to support the audit process, as well as your anticipated timing of an IPO or an M&A event. I think this is definitely not something to jump into too quickly because it definitely is a burden um, or an additional work for everyone at the company. Um, and especially as you're focused on growth, um, oftentimes this is something that is not right early in the in the timeline. Um, 
And then again, this last piece here on this slide highlights again my little tidbit on making sure to keep everything. Audits will generally rely on supporting documentation. So having that support, especially for past periods, will significantly help in the performance of the audit, especially if you do an audit later on for historical periods as well. Um, and lastly, while the potential of being a public company may be multiple years away, we wanted to highlight a few things to be aware of as you may get closer to that date, especially as it relates to the finance and accounting functions. The need to comply with regulatory requirements, preparation of timely financials information and the related disclosure, and maintenance and documentation of effective controls will require a transformation that may include additional and elevated accounting and finance headcount and strong processes. However, in the earlier stages, like I mentioned earlier, please keep it simple. We understand that accounting and finance may not be your number one focus as you grow your business and hope that we've been able to share a little bit of information that may be helpful for you. Um, and with that, I am going to pass it back to Colin to kick off Q&A. Awesome, thank you so much, Marissa and Minji. We know that was a lot of information, but it's important information because as you mentioned, as you start growing your companies faster, this stuff starts getting more complicated and you wanna concentrate on growing and growing appropriately. So there's a lot of questions that came into the Q&A, so thank you. If you have any additional questions for Marissa or Minji, just drop them into the Q&A box. We'll hope to get to all of these. Um, Minji, looks like there's a lot of tax related questions, but we still have some that uh, Marissa can take a piece of. Um, one that I, uh, that is very um, interesting is re regarding R&D credits. So do, does it mean a company can carry R&D credits forward on the balance sheet? And if two years, and if in two years, the company starts to get out of the loss position, uh, can they apply them to offset profits? Yes, that's correct. So if in the loss position, you can carry over on your balance sheet, you know, if not use it, you can carry over for 20 years. Then oh, wow. in these cases, if you in the income position two or three years later, you can using the R&D credit to offset your any cash liability. Yeah, that's the, how the mechanism of the R&D credits work. Love that. Yeah, the R&D tax credit is definitely a uh, fun one that a lot of people don't know about. Um, Let me just add in one more thing on that. There are um, some R&D tax credits for smaller companies with revenues under a certain threshold that are direct cash reimbursement. Um, so don't need to wait until you um, yeah. end up Thanks with- Yeah, I think you're right. Income. You can you can offset your R&D credit on your payroll tax liability if you are small business. So you don't need to carry over. You can offset your payroll tax liability. That's the benefit um, for being a small business. There are like a threshold, like if you, I think it's below, if you below 26 million revenue for the past three years, then you qualify for small business. So you can cash out those credits to the payroll tax. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Marissa. Yeah, and I think I saw a question just around like how you determine if you qualify or if or how you would qualify. I think the determination of what R&D costs is complex in like which R&D costs would apply. Um, but especially in these situations where you can get direct tax or direct cash benefit, um, I would encourage you to think about um, hiring an accounting firm or tax firm to help you get those credits because it can be a immediate benefit to you. I love that. Um, there's a couple questions for our uh, small or solo entrepreneurial uh, tax uh, op op options out there. So one is around um, what size companies are most likely to offer options, like can a solo entrepreneur or a small team do this? Um, and then also another question around, um, you know, for Marissa, potentially, 
would you suggest using QuickBooks or Zero or something along those lines or hiring a bookkeeper early on? I, I can start on some is, of those and Minji, you can add on on. I think yeah, that yeah, um, you, my understanding is that any company can, can issue options. Um, the ISOs, which Minji was talking about earlier that do have the beneficial tax treatment for um, holders um, requires you to hold the ISO for a certain period of time even after exercise to maintain those tax benefits. Um, so being aware of those as well is important, but I believe that anyone can offer the options um, and, and get those benefits over time as long as the company has the available stock to cover the options if exercised. Um, we have plenty of people in like the payroll tax group. So if there are further questions on that, feel free to reach out to both Minji and I, um, and we can get you more answers specifically on those items. In terms of the bookkeeping, um, any of those work fine. Um, I think we see most companies on QuickBooks early on. Uh, there are also plenty of even startup companies now that are offering bookkeeping services to small companies. Um, and so that's also an option, but again, um, at early stages, even Excel or Google Sheets works fine to just be tracking your expenses and revenues, just like um, anyone would kind of keep a budget for themselves. Not that I do as I should as an accountant, but um, I know a lot of my accountant friends do keep their own um, budgets and even like create their own balance sheet to, to track their assets and things like that. So um, even using Excel or Google Sheets is fine. Awesome. Yeah, that's way more organized than I am. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. A quick question. There's a, a couple questions that came in around deductions. Can you talk about uh, where people can find more information on what items are deductible? What expenses are, Minji or and or Mar Marissa? From um, a business perspective. From, yeah. yeah. So for tax purpose, you know, our starting point is from the accounting was the net income. And then we do like an account by account analysis wasn't deductible, not deductible. So I would say most of the item is tax follow book is deductible. And then there were some, some item is not deductible. For example, the entertainment, right? Entertainment is not deductible. We need to add back. And then any meals travel related is 50% deductible. Um, and then all those compensation related, you have to pay within two and a half months at the end, otherwise it's not deductible, um, but you can deduct in the, in the next year when you paid. So I think Marissa Prison mentioned like for financial accounting purpose is on the accrual basis, right? But for tax, I would say it's more like a cash basis. For tax people, we, most of the question we will ask, when did you pay? those expenses? Have you actually paid? It's not a cool, right? Our triggering event for taxes, when did you pay it? As long as you paid, you can, you can take the deduction on that year. Um, that's my, my high level answer. Yeah, high Thank level you. answer. And again, if they're like we, I'm sure we have spreadsheets and information and things like that. So we can also get that out to the group, or um, if you want to send us an email, we can also circle back with you on that information. I love that. Um, appreciate it. Um, so there, there were a couple questions on like location. So are there any thoughts on setting up an LLC in Washington or Delaware for state tax purposes, even if you're not located there? Yeah, for that, that's a good question. I think, um, and everyone know Delaware is, you know, they have a very well established corporate law. A lot of uh, um, VC firms are over there. So 
maybe 10 years ago, the investor is looking at, oh, you have to be a Delaware because they prefer that they have a very sophisticated, you know, uh, corporate law tax system. So they prefer the entity in the Delaware. But in the recent years, you know, you can see the Seattle, a lot of uh, company in Seattle, they can, you know, have very successful fundraising for the company registered in, in, in Washington. So I think the investor also changing in mind because the location is not, it's not like, like a decision maker. It's just a formality of the entity, whether you're located in Washington or, or Delaware. What they are care is about what's your problem, right? What's your technology? What's, how do you resolve your, 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 your problem, your solution? What solution you have? They for more focus on your product, your service. The formality of your entity is not a big deal. In addition, if they really care as, the US, as a Delaware entity, then it's easy to convert to um, the Washington entity to Delaware. So it's not a big deal. That's and you great. definitely don't need to be located there. Like yeah, most yeah. companies are headquartered out here and um, incorporated in Delaware. Amazing. Well, there's so many great questions in the Q&A, and I don't think we'll be able to get to all of them. But in the, e in the email that we follow up with the recording, with the slides, we'll include Marissa and Minji's email in there. So if you guys have any follow up questions, feel free to reach out to them and hopefully they'll be able to address all of them. Um, we're almost at time, but and uh, somebody in my room is begging for attention, but he's very excited about this presentation just as, as much as all of you are. Um, Marissa, maybe any parting words? What's one thing that you want our audience to take away today with regards to tax and finance as they grow their companies? Yep, um, and thank you, Colin. I have said it a few times and I'll say it again. Um, keep your documentation, keep that support, um, make sure you have the underlying documents for your revenue and your costs and um, just to make sure you have it, just keep it all. Um, and thank you again, everyone. We're so grateful that you were here with us today and hope that we were able to help a little bit. So um, please get in contact with us if you have any more questions and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Marissa and Minji. Really appreciate you guys contributing your time and wisdom because tax and finance is something that I'm not an expert in, but glad to have people you like you in our corner that are. So on behalf of everyone at the center and everyone in attendance today, thank you so much, Marissa and Minji, for sharing a little bit of your insights today. And we hope that everyone online can join us at our upcoming webinars. And we look forward to seeing you all online soon. Take it easy, everybody. Happy Friday.